Anyone that has done their reading of Zimbabwean history has heard of the Willowgate scandal. It was one of the few Zimbabwean scandals in which all the details were laid out in public, unlike others that are murky and shrouded in mystery. The story of Willowgate takes us back to the days of colonial Zimbabwe when the nation was still called Rhodesia. After Rhodesia's illegal unilateral declaration of independence in 1965, its automotive industry struggled to remain on its feet. UN sanctions imposed on Rhodesia meant the unrecognized nation could not import complete vehicles, and to worsen things, the two domestic assembly plants that belonged to the British Motor Company and Ford lost access to their export markets. Ultimately, production stagnated and both plants had to close in early 1967. In a bid to solve the crisis, the state-owned Rhodesian Industrial Development Corporation established a motor vehicle assembly plant called Willowvale Motor Industries. This company would import kits and assemble the cars in Rhodesia. They assembled for many car brands including Toyota, BMW, and Nissan, and continued to do so even after the transition to majority rule and as Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. So then, what went wrong, and where did the scandal come from? In the 1980s, production at Willowvale decreased sharply as a result of a shortage of foreign currency, and this did not make sense as the Zimbabwean economy was on an upward curve. At the time, Zimbabwe was considered by many to be one of the most prosperous nations on the African continent. The shortage had stemmed from the fact that Zimbabwe had decided to pay off its foreign debt on schedule, rather than stretching out interest and principal payments over a longer period. In 1988, more than a third of its $1.8 billion foreign income went to pay off the debt, and a greater part of the remainder was spent on oil imports and military training. The importing of car assembly kits was considered a luxury. To get a full picture of how Willowville suffered, the number of vehicles assembled declined from a peak of 7,430 in 1982 to a meager 2,416 in 1988. Demand overshadowed supply greatly in a market with a demand of 20,000 to 25,000 cars per year. It might seem outlandish, but there was a drastic car famine in the country. The general populace was turned into a nation of hitchhikers. The situation became slightly chaotic when the peak hours came in the cities. Everyone was in a rush to hitch a ride because even buses were scarce. Some Zimbabweans flooded into neighboring Botswana to get their hands on anything that rolled. Sadly, they paid anything for cars that did not roll far enough. Most of them did not even make it to Zimbabwe. Those that eventually made it ended up not being much more than decorations for their owner's yards. The problems kept on piling. The influx of barely functional cars led to yet another shortage, the shortage of spare parts. The scarcity made motor vehicles a precious commodity with high demand. Naturally, the prices rose exponentially. Both new and second-hand vehicles were much sought after. To put some control over the market, the government introduced price controls on the sale of motor vehicles. All over the country, there was a long waiting list for cars, but the law allowed ministers and members of parliament to jump to the head of the line. This was because they needed cars to carry out official business. In October of 1988, a letter with an enclosed check landed on the desk of a Bulawayo businessman named Obert Mpofu. Mr. Mpofu was baffled as to why he would be entitled for a $1,900 rebate from the Zimbabwean government's Willowvale Auto Assembly Plant for a car he had not ordered and would not be entitled to buy for many years. Feeling that something was up, Mpofu passed on the check to Jeffrey Nyarota and Davison Marusiva, who at the time worked as editors for the state-owned Bulawayo Chronicle, which had a reputation for aggressive and rigorous investigations into corruption at all levels of government. Marusiva phoned a contact at the Willowvale car plants that he knew from the days when he was news editor at the Herald, another state-owned newspaper. This contact supplied Marusiva with more documents that showed there were some illicit dealings happening at the plant. In December of the same year, the Chronicle began to run a series of articles that documented and unearthed how ministers and officials in the Mugabe government were abusing their privileges of having the first preference on vehicles. What the team had discovered was that officials were buying cars and reselling them at a higher price for a profit. According to the Chronicle's articles, some officials were buying up to four cars at the original price and reselling them with a markup. The story became a bestseller and demand for the Chronicle increased overnight. 
The paper would sell out in minutes every morning with people eager to get the latest on the scandal that had been dubbed Willowgate. Since most of the culprits were government officials and colleagues, it was imperative that the leader of the nation make a move or at least make a statement, which he did. President Robert Mugabe set up the Sandura Commission, a commission of inquiry headed by Justice Wilson Sandura. It took over seven weeks to record statements from 72 witnesses, including six government ministers, two deputy ministers, three members of parliament, two senior army officers, and 40 directors of companies that were involved in the scandal. The commission learned that vehicles that were assembled at Willowvale were distributed to car dealers at dealers' rates which were lower than market prices. The dealers' rates were usually $3,000 to $4,000 lower than market rates depending on the type of vehicle. However, Willowvale also had the discretion to sell 1% of the vehicles it made per year to persons other than dealers, and it was this facility that was abused by the culprits. Ministers, MPs, and senior civil servants began to interfere with Willowvale's discretion for their personal or friend's benefit. When the political elites and their associates received the vehicles, they were charged dealers' prices, and when they went on to sell them, they did so at prices way above the controlled rates and they made vast profits. Among the culprits was the political elite Maurice Nyagumbo, a senior minister in Mugabe's government who was widely regarded as one of Mugabe's most loyal lieutenants. They had spent years together in jail during the liberation struggle and Nyagumbo had a role in Mugabe's ascendancy to the leadership of ZANU-PF. The commission found that he assisted several individuals to acquire vehicles from Willowvale using the name of the ruling party ZANU-PF, and sometimes claiming that authorization had been granted by the president when in fact there was none. In most, if not all cases, the vehicles were sold at a high profit. One of the people that benefited from Nyagumbo's intervention was the wealthy businessman Sam Levy. Levy approached Nyagumbo for help to acquire a vehicle and Nyagumbo facilitated the purchase, claiming that the vehicles were for ZANU-PF. Sam Levy paid $29,000 for the vehicle, which was the dealer's price. For context, this amount was $5,000 less than the retail price. Levy then sold the vehicle to Lion Insurance Company for $105,000 a year later, making an astronomical profit. The story took a dark turn when Nyagumbo died on the 28th of April 1989. The official report claimed that he committed suicide. However, some conspiracy theories cast doubt on the official narrative. Another culprit was Enos Nkala. Enos was one of the senior ministers in Mugabe's government. He was, in fact, a founding member of ZANU-PF and hosted a formation of the party at his house. He had occupied key and influential posts like the Minister of Finance in the past, but at the time of the scandal, he was the Minister of Defense. Like Nagumbo, Nkala was a true political heavyweight of the Mugabe generation. The Sandura Commission found out that he had facilitated the purchase of a Mazda 323 for Naran, a Bulawayo-based businessman with whom he had a strong business relationship. The car cost $15,200, which was $3,000 less than the retail price, and went on to sell it for $52,000 to a company called Monarch Products, another Bulawayo-based company. The politician made a profit of $37,000. Enos and Kala carried out similar schemes with other types of vehicles. After the dealings were discovered, Nkala later resigned his post as Minister of Defense. In other cases, business elites used their employees as fronts to cover their tracks in corrupt and illegal transactions. It is said that Naran, the Bulawayo businessman, used his employee Alford Mpofu to acquire vehicles from Willowvale under the auspices that he was an aspiring businessman. Minister Kalistus Sandovu, who was in charge of the Willowvale plant, knew this was not true, but he still went on to instruct Willowvale to allocate vehicles to Alford Mpofu. Frederick Shawa was another senior minister who was implicated in the scandal. The commission heard that Shawa purchased four cars from Willowvale and other car dealers and resold them at a profit. The first was a Mazda 323 purchased in an arrangement with one individual named Muhammad. The commission had reason to believe that Shawa purchased the car before selling it onto Muhammad at a substantial profit. Shawa then bought a Nissan Cabster truck for $45,000 from Kenning Motors at the beginning of 1988 and soon resold it to a businessman in Chitungwiza for $75,000, making a profit of $30,000. Upon inquiry, the reason he gave for selling it was that he discovered that he no longer needed a vehicle. The commission found that Shawa had committed perjury and hoped that the attorney general would institute proceedings. The attorney general took action and Shawa was to be prosecuted for perjury. 
Shawa was convicted and sentenced to nine months imprisonment. However, he was swiftly rescued by Robert Mugabe, who issued a presidential pardon. Mugabe said shortly afterward, Who amongst us has not lied? Yesterday, you were with your girlfriend and you told your wife that you were with the Prime Minister. Should you get nine months for that? Shawa, who escaped prison thanks to Mugabe, now serves as the country's foreign affairs minister. Other high-profile individuals that were implicated in the scandal include Opa Muchinguri, the current Minister of Defense, Jacob Mudenda, the current Head of Parliament, and the late Lieutenant General Solomon Mujuru. Obert Mpofu, the man who was instrumental in the uncovering of the scandal, went on to serve as Minister of Mines and has been implicated in some high-profile corruption scandals of his own. In a country where uncovering such cases is practically a death mission, you must be wondering what happened to the two men who cracked the case. Nyarota and Marusiva were both forced out of their jobs with a state-owned paper and into newly created high-paying public relations positions in Harare. One government minister referred to the process as elimination by promotion. Willowgate was a big shock in the 1980s. The scandal is an important bookmark in the history of Zimbabwe and is cited by many as the scandal that sowed the seeds of impunity among public officials. Nowadays, public officials are now untouchable. Little is done to hold them accountable for their abuse of office. Corruption at levels of life is now the norm in the country. It is estimated that Zimbabwe loses $1.2 billion annually to corruption, money that could be used to revive the country's ailing infrastructure, hospitals, schools, and industries. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe to see more videos like this one. If you want to learn more about this topic, check out the video description for some links to articles and videos that were helpful in making this video. One of the links is for an interview with Mr. Jeffrey Nyarota himself in which he shares more detail about the scandal. So make sure you check it out.